This represents the millennium, as you see on the large chart. The seventh and last dispensation of seven dispensations from the fall of Adam to the end of a rebellion on this planet Earth and the reestablishment of the kingdom of God eternally without any rebellion in it. This is pictured in Revelation 20, as we we have already stated before, Christ will come and the uh, resurrected saints of all ages, the blessed and holy people, will live and reign with Christ a thousand years. The devil will be bound and cast into the bottomless pit during a thousand years to deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be finished. Now all this is in the 20th chapter of Revelation. Then after that, after the thousand years, he must be loosed a little season. Now just a few statements concerning the conditions of the millennium itself. We've seen that Christ will actually land on this planet Earth, on the Mount of Olives, will fight the battle of Armageddon, will seize the governments of this world, will gather the nations and judge them to decide who is worthy of entrance into the kingdom and who is not. After the judgment is over with, Christ and the resurrected saints will take over all the governments of this world and will, will reign from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. That will not be the eternal perfect state or the perfect age yet, for sin will continue. Rebellion will continue. While we read in Isaiah 65, verses 20 to 25, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, not an old man that hath not filled his days. A child shall die in hundred years. So you see, uh, people will multiply. Marriage will go right on. Child shall die in hundred years. But a sinner, proving there will be sin, rebellion, Sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. As the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor or bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring, their children, with them. We read also in verse 25 of that chapter, or verse 25 of that 65th chapter, that the wolf and the lamb, the fattening, shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. That shows you there will be changes in the animal kingdom. As also pictured in Isaiah 11, where we read in verse 9, that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And a child shall play on the hole of an ass, and a weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. And it pictures also in that chapter about the different animals lying down together, feeding together, and no more destruction of each other. In the second chapter of Isaiah, verses 2 to 4, we read, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hill. Many nations shall say, Come. Let us go up to the mountain of the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their weapons into pruning hooks and so on. They shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Then Zechariah 14 will be fulfilled. We gave you a portion of it a few moments ago concerning the battle of Armageddon. How that the Lord will come and set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, verse 9 of that chapter says. There shall be one Lord in his name, one, and verse 16 says, shall come to pass every one that is left of all these nations, which came up against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of tabernacles. Thus we find that all the nations who are worthy of entrance into the kingdom will live a normal life. Children will be born. They'll continue to marry and give in marriage. And the animal natures will be changed. They'll go up from year to year to worship the king at Jerusalem once a year. And we read in Zechariah 14, that whosoever shall not go up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king and keep the feast of tabernacles upon them, there shall be no rain. There shall be holiness on the bells of the horses and every pot and pan in Jerusalem shall be holiness under the Lord of hosts. Many other scriptures describe conditions in this millennial kingdom. Isaiah 30, 26 tells us that the light will be changed. Light will be increased. The daylight seven times lighter than it is today, and the night time in that period will be as our present day. In the day that God bindeth up the people and heedeth the stroke of their wound. We read in Isaiah 35 that water shall spring forth in the desert. The desert shall blossom as a rose. 
The lame man shall leap like an hawk. The tongue of the dumb shall sing. That teaches us there will be universal healing. Everybody will be well. Everybody will be prosperous. Everybody will sit under his own vine and fig tree, as Micah 4 tells us. And as Isaiah 65, they shall build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not build and say, that's my property, get out or pay your rent. They'll not do that. They'll all build their own houses, all have their own places. We'll have a wonderful time during that eternal kingdom. Of course, the eternal kingdom, I say that because it, this condi- these good conditions are going to continue forever. They will begin at the second coming of Christ and continue eternally. There will be certain evils, certain sins that will not continue eternally. Certain conditions will last only for a thousand years, such as the possibility of rebelling, the possibility of rejecting Jesus Christ and of getting right with God, and things like that. That will continue during the millennial reign itself. I do not say that people cannot get right with God after the millennium, that is, uh, receive the benefits or enjoy the benefits of salvation. But that will be the time when there will be sinners here that can repent and get right with God and become born again and receive the Holy Spirit and all the blessings of God men can receive today. For Joel 2.28 tells us in those days, even in the millennium, that God will pour out of his Spirit upon all flesh. For he says it shall come to pass afterward, that is, after the final restoration of Israel in the millennium. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Joel's prophecy was fulfilled at Pentecost. It's been fulfilled thousands of times through this age. It will be fulfilled in these latter days, and it will continue to be fulfilled in the millennium. Spiritual blessings that men can receive today will be experienced by men in the millennium, all who will desire such blessings. Physical blessings will be for everybody. All demon powers will be confined to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And uh, there will be no demons to cause sicknesses and diseases that we have in the world today. So there will be universal healing for all. Salvation for all who will accept. Then uh, concerning material blessings, we've seen they'll have their own homes, their own fig trees, their own vines, their own property. And uh, there shall there will be universal peace, no more war for 1,000 years. And that itself is going to be wonderful. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Then we read of the resurrected saints reigning as kings and priests under Christ. Christ promised the twelve apostles that they shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And we read of the division of the land of Palestine and the twelve great strips of land running east and west from Dan on the north to Gad on the south. Read the 47th and 48th chapters of the book of Ezekiel. We read also in the book of Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 of a great temple that will be built to God in that time. The temple will be one mile square. That is the temple enclosure, the tabernacle itself. And on the inside of this temple enclosure there will be a temple. The dimensions of that temple are described and plainly listed in Ezekiel chapters 1 to 44. In the, uh, that is uh, 40 to 44. And in the 45th chapter, the 7th verse of Ezekiel, we read, After the description of this temple, Son of man, the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. In 47th chapter of Ezekiel, we have a river flowing out from under the throne of God, or out from under this capital building. Flowing south through the city of Jerusalem, it will be divided into two parts. Half of it will flow into the Mediterranean Sea and half of it into the Dead Sea. The waters of the Dead Sea will be healed. And fish will come from the Mediterranean Sea up through this branch, down the other branch, into the Dead Sea, exceeding many. And we read in that chapter of men casting their fish nets upon the shores of the Dead Sea. The sea today in which nothing can live. The waters will be healed. Evidently by that great earthquake which will divide Mount Olivet in two and half of the mountain will flee toward the north and half of it toward the south and make a very great valley. There will be an outlet to the Dead Sea and the waters will become fresh. There will be some parts around the Dead Sea which will be left for salt. That's all. Now then, concerning the other conditions of the kingdom, 
We, have, we, we know from certain statements in the Bible that the purpose of this kingdom is to put all enemies, all rebels, under the feet of God and finally restore God's kingdom as it was or as before rebellion started in the universe in the days of Lucifer and Adam. In 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 24 to 28, we have the purpose of this first thousand years plainly expressed. Now remember, the kingdom is eternal. The first thousand years is what we're talking about now. The first thousand years of the eternal kingdom. There's a definite purpose to be accomplished in that first thousand years, which will never be possible to accomplish in the eternal ages, because it will be finished. And the purpose is, is this, as, as expressed by Paul. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when all things shall be subdued under him, it is manifested that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued under him, the Son himself, shall become subject unto him that did put all things under him, that God may be all and all. You see the purpose of this first thousand years of the eternal reign of Christ is to rid the earth of all rebellion, to, to destroy all enemies. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. If a, command, if a man commits a sin during the millennium, which has the death penalty, he will be immediately tried by the resurrected saints and will be executed according to his crime. There will be no church pulls, political pulls, lodge pulls, government mental pulls, and relative pulls, and, and any kind of pull to get a fellow out of trouble in that day. A man breaks the law, he'll have to, to pay the penalty. And that's the way it is with God forever. A lot of people think that the penalty for the broken law has changed, especially in connection with Christians, but it has not changed in connection with anyone. The penalty for sin is death. That was the law of God from Genesis 2.17 on through the Old Testament and on through the New Testament. And that will hold true in the millennial kingdom. While we read, a child shall die in hundred years, but a sinner, sinner, being a hundred years old shall be accursed or executed. Isaiah 65, 20. So the purpose of this thousand years is to rid the earth of all rebellion and bring the earth back to a place where it was before the fall of, of uh, the pre-Adamite world and before the fall of Adam later. There have been two great rebellions on this planet. One in the days of Lucifer, Long before the days of Adam, the pre-Adamite world rebelled. And how long it continued in rebellion, we do not know. But for an indefinite period, Lucifer ruled in perfection without any sin on the earth. Then for a period, there was a rebellion on the earth. And how long God tolerated that rebellion, we do not know. But God finally took action. And Second Peter 3, 5 tells us the world that then was, the cosmos, the social system before Adam that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, since the six days of restoration of the earth and the days of Adam, are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then when Adam was created about 6,000 years ago, he soon rebelled. And that brought the earth into its second sinful career. The earth has been in rebellion against God over 6,000 years up to 1953. The earth will continue in rebellion against God until Jesus Christ comes with an army sufficiently large enough to take over the governments of this world in a real battle and sufficiently large enough to seize the governments of this world and reign here with a rod of iron for the purpose of putting down rebellion and destroying every rebel left on the earth. Now that's the purpose of the millennial reign. Of Christ. So this present rebellion on the earth will end at the end of the millennium, when the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 